Uh, I, moved to, I moved from D.C. to Minnesota last January. I moved to Minnesota in the dead of winter for the same reason anyone moves to this part of the country that time of year, involuntary drug rehab. <laughs> all my friends back home, they all know that I had a drinking problem, right? But I got an email from a friend of mine asking me to be in a beer pong tournament with him. And that's fucked up, right? <laughs> because alcoholism's a disease. Like, I don't ask grandma to play memory. <laughs> right? You guys seem like a nice audience. You guys wouldn't ask Michael J. Fox to play Django, would you? There's <laughs> probably got some Family Times fans in the house. You say what you want about grandma, you lay off Alex P. Keaton. <laughs> Everybody wants to know when they're in recovery, like what did it, what was rock bottom? They always think that's gonna be a hilarious story. <laughs> Cocaine and strippers. Not always the case. What happened to me could happen to anyone in here. I was out on a Saturday night, just like tonight, and I had like two beers, and then I was driving home, and then all of a sudden my car filled up with vodka and olives. <laughs> And I was like, this is way too much vodka and olives. I don't even think I can drink all of this. I happen to know that local law enforcement officials are cracking down on drunk driving. I feel like if I get pulled over, the vodka will rush out onto the officer. I gotta know how you get out of that ticket. My buddy warned me, he's like, you're getting bad, man. It happened to me one night I was driving home my motorcycle helmet filled up with beer. It's a fucking ridiculous commercial. <laughs> the actual truth of it is, the real rock model story, not much better. It's pretty funny still. But uh, what really happened, I went on a binge a couple summers ago in St. Paul. And when I say I went on a binge, I mean I lost track of all the five W's they teach you in high school. Like what, when, where, how, and most importantly why went out the window. And I woke up in a detox center having no idea where I was. And like, if, you, if you're having trouble picturing a detox center, like imagine like an orphanage without the compassion. <laughs> Only it's like dark and in a basement there's no windows, so in your case, little orphan Annie, the sun does not come out tomorrow. And uh, I'm sitting in the bed, like, trying to figure out what day it is, even. And I start hearing these big, booming noises coming from outside. And I'm like, what could that possibly be? And that's when I realized that it was the 4th of July. <laughs> they were fireworks. <laughs> Which, I guess, there are worse days to wake up at a detox center. Like, but if you wake up at a detox center on Thanksgiving, they don't cook a turkey next door and, like, waft the smell in at you. Like, if, if you wake up on Christmas, like, the carolers don't come to the door. Like, you see why that's sad, right? That I ended up on 4th of July. Like, the Founding Fathers fought for my freedom on the 4th, and I gave it back with a 5th on the 3rd. <laughs> right? Like, you shouldn't wake up in what appears to be an orphanage on the one day where we all had fathers. Like, just, like, I got into an argument with the guard. I'm like, I'm like, you gotta let me out of here, man. I'm supposed to be blowing shit up and eating hot dogs. <laughs> and he's like, you're going nowhere. I'm like, for God's sakes, it's Independence Day. <laughs> no. <laughs> when, you, when I first got out of rehab, I worked, uh, I worked at the Mall of America at uh, Bubba Gump Shrimp Company as a server. And after I would get off work, I'd be walking home and I would think to myself, I hope a car hits me at a speed that will instantly kill me. That's what it was like to work there. I was like passive aggressively trying to get myself fired. Like my new thing was that I would show up exactly 15 minutes late to work every day. Just to show them that I could get somewhere at an exact time every day. I just choose to be late for their shitty job. And two days after I wrote that joke, I got fired. I had to look for a new job, and I didn't, when I first got out, I didn't have a cell phone. You know how hard that is to pass yourself off as a responsible human being when you don't own a phone? Like, I interviewed with a manager, and she didn't even believe me. She was like, how could you not have a cell phone? I'm like, listen, ma'am, I'm 27 years old and I'm applying to be a Papa John's delivery boy. <laughs> Obviously, I've made some poor choices. <laughs> Let's just not harp on it. <laughs> I feel like I would have been better off checking the I've Committed Multiple Felonies box 
than telling her I don't have a cell phone. Like, in the end, John, we decided to go with two felonies, Bob. Yeah, he does have two DUIs. He's also got T-Mobile. It's a good plan. You should check it out. When I worked at Papa John's, and people asked me where I worked, that's what I said, Papa John's, which seems right. But I was at a party with a coworker of mine one time, and somebody asked him where he worked. And he said, and I quote, I've been in the pizza game for about four years now. And I was like, no, you are not in the pizza game. You know how I know? Games have winners. <laughs> Nobody here has ever won anything. While we're at it, if the last thing you do at the end of your shift is take the world's biggest refrigerator magnet off the top of your car, you're also not living a thug life. Get it together, you winner. I joke a lot about the job that I have, but I think the truth was I always knew that I was born to be an artist. I just have never found a subway that's hiring. <laughs> yeah, sandwich artist, the guy can dream, right? Like, I want to work at Subway just for one week, just so I can get into the middle of the lunch rush and start topping someone's sandwich whatever way I want to top it. <laughs> and have them complain to my 17-year-old manager. <laughs> like, listen, Evan, I can't work like this. I am an artist. I did not go to Sandwich University for two days to have you come out here and talk to me like this in front of these people. Just take a smoke break right in the middle of time and some lady's sandwich is... Sistine Chapel wasn't built in the day, man. Sandwich is like all art take time and inspiration. Now sit down and shut the fuck up. Yeah, Evan, if you don't like the way I talk to the customers, you can suck out my $5 foot long. It's a little false advertising for the ladies. Not five dollars. <laughs> oh, I lived. <laughs> all that was going on. I lived in a in a sober house with all the all roommates. We were all sober at the same time, which is a weird situation. Like there have all kinds of rules for you when you live in a house like that. Like one of the rules was we had to be out of the house from nine o'clock in the morning till three o'clock in the afternoon. And I got caught sneaking back in to take a nap. Because that's how I do. And I got called into the director's office. And she goes, what's the deal, John? You want to just go back to drinking? And I was like, kind of. Have you tried it? It's a lot of fun. <laughs> and then she goes, your counselor tells me that you want to be a stand-up comedian. You can't be a stand-up comedian with a drinking and drug problem. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't get that joke, welcome to your first comedy show. There are going to be some themes that emerge. I don't even know what to tell people. That I was like, oh, man, have you heard of, I don't know, Chris Farley or John Belushi or Richard Pryor or anyone who's ever been funny? I don't know. Where was it? Oh, yeah, sober romance. You have the same types of arguments you have in any house, but the context is different. I could give you guys an example. I had to separate two of my roommates. They were having a fight over who left a dirty dish in the sink. But one was a crackhead and the other smoked meth. <laughs> and I literally had to pull them apart. I'm like, listen, seven months ago, you sold your BMW for $500 worth of crack cocaine. You have one tooth. <laughs> Let's chill out about the dishes. Like, you can't I can understand if it was the blender, but what are you going to do with a dish? And you, where the hell are all the spoons? Yeah, you expect me to believe you've been sober for six months and we have one spoon in this house? I'm going through all this. this like I, now pretty much all I do is go to AA meetings and comedy shows, but it'll get to the point where I forget which one of the two that I'm at. <laughs> like, I was in an AA meeting with a buddy of mine the other day, and I turned him like, this guy is not funny at all. <laughs> what is this joke about smoking dope with a pregnant hooker? <laughs> it's a little dark. And the crying and the please God forgive me, Jesus, act like
like a pro. You know what? See if that crackhead wants to do five more minutes, because he was hilarious. <laughs>